Kate Curlin to lead things off for a Florida team that is 12 and 8 overall, 2 and 1 after a series win in the league last week and a first pitch fastball breezes by Curlin for strike one. And that's where you're going to see Holman. He likes to take that four seam fastball, pitch it up just about the way he's top of the strike zone. That way he can get to that slider and curveball. Held the swing on the second. Our home plate umpire tonight is Kevin Sweeney. First of three, the weather is just about perfect. It'll dip down into the high 50s before we're finished. 1-1 one, one to Curlin is a curveball swung on a miss. 1-2. and two. Sun sets on this Friday night in red stick. Temperature in the low 70s at first pitch. There was a threat of rain. It never materialized. That's good news. Swing and a miss again. And Holman dispatches Curlin. Well, after a five year absence, Kevin O'Sullivan got Florida back to Omaha last season. He's in his 17th year with the Gators, owns a national championship. And he's had his hands full, kind of trying to figure out Jack Caglione and how to best use him. Nine home runs of the season. He's hit two home runs twice in the last five games. He takes a fastball off the hip. We'll save the Caglione conversation, it seems. Well, I could help Sully out on how to use Caglione. How about you just plug him in the lineup every game and <laughs> let him pitch once on the weekend, and it'll do pretty good for you. He's got that figured out now. He's, we'll see him on Sunday as a starter. He's been the best starter for Florida on the weekend this year. That, that's been their challenge, and we're not used to seeing that with Florida generally on the weekend. They're as good as anybody in the country. They've scuffled a little bit on the bounce so far, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. 5-7-8 ERA as a team. Here's Luke Heyman, the DH for Florida. In the first pitch, low and away. Heyman well, got him with a strike. They're not, he didn't hold it. They're not seeing that breaking ball. And I know it's super early, but Curlin swung a two out of the zone. And that time, Heyman, you got to get ready for the elevated fastball, which Holman has done consistently, but he's had three swing throughs already on the breaking ball. Well, that breaking ball, that slider is now 61% swing and miss. I mean, we talk about the college average slider swung and missed about 33% of the time. His at 61%. So that's how good it's been. It's 100% so far tonight. <laughs> Heyman had a great year last year. SEC freshman team with 51 starts for this Florida team that made it in the College World Series finals and gets AM last week in a crucial game tying home run in the fourth inning of game three. He's got Cat Leon at first, who hasn't attempted a stolen base this year. Nothing in two. Luke Holman had a really solid year at Alabama last year. Seven and four with a 367 ERA. Was the Friday night guy at Alabama last year. A lot of big time SEC experience. Swing and a miss and a fastball up. Second K for Holman. Well, no surprises here. Just what we said he was going to go use up the fastball up to get to the slider. So back to back sliders, and he just takes a fastball right above the top of the zone, and nothing Heyman can do with it. Two down for Colby Shelton, who we featured with this Florida batting order. Double digit home runs. He's driven in 22. And the first pitch fastball at 93 is up and in on the hands. 1 0 for the sophomore from Lexington, South Carolina. Well, these two guys have faced each other, but it was in fall ball last year because both of them were wearing Alabama jerseys. Shelton was a first team All America with the Tide last year. Breaking ball in for a strike. Tied with George's Charlie Condon for the SEC single season freshman home run record. He did set the Alabama freshman home run record. Shift is on for the lefty and the pitch misses up in the zone at nearly 94. That's going to be the key for Florida tonight is laying off that one. It's just up and out of the zone. We've already seen three or four swing throughs on the fastball but all have been elevated and all have been just up and out. Mm. Swing and a miss and that one kicks off the catcher Travinsky and gets all the way to the on deck circle. Well, this is kind of what makes Holman special, right? I mean, even when he gets himself in fastball counts, you're not always going to get the fastball. He has the pitch ability and the confidence to take his breaking balls and use his breaking balls in plus counts or fastball. That's a real 12 to 6 breaking ball that Trubinsky can't keep in front. So 2 and 2 to Shelton with Caglione in scoring position. Low and in, full count. Shelton.
Shelton was only two for 11 against LSU last year while wearing an Alabama uniform. Payoff pitch. Swing and a miss on a breaking ball that is on point for home. Well, probably both, but over the course of, of the year, the, the batting average should come down on balls that are put into play. Here's Arizona transfer Mac Bingham, senior from San Diego and Torrey Pines High School. Bingham's hit safely in five of six. In for a strike. Two seventy three average with three home runs and connected for two of those in games last week one over the weekend and one in the midweek. I can't thank you. Welcome to Baton Rouge for the Friday night game between sixth ranked Florida and number five LSU two teams who last met in Omaha with a World Series title on the line. Dale Thomas off the bag at third makes a fantastic play to retire Mac Bingham. You miss one half a play in that half Luke Holman struck out the side from the Florida Gators and now Kate Fisher on the mound facing all American Tommy White who carries a seven game hit streak into this at bat. Tom Hart, Kyle Peterson, Ben McDonald. We've got a full booth. And Ben, a guy in Tommy White who's got to carry the load for this rebuilt LSU roster. No doubt. And he carried the load last year, too. How about 105 RBIs in 66 games for the Tigers last year? Led the nation in RBIs. Another monster season after a monster freshman year at NC State. And yeah, it was a little bit of a slow start for him, but boy, has he heated up the last six or seven games. He homered in every game of the Mississippi State Series last weekend. In fact, he's homered in four straight, and in that span, nine for his last 18 with nine ribbies. Overall, a seven-game hit streak for Tommy White, and that fastball in on the elbow. Yeah, I think his struggles early in the year, just kind of getting out in front, trying to do a little bit too much too early in the season, rolled over a lot of balls, but now he's starting to power the ball where he's at his best out toward right center field. The, if I remember right, the same thing happened last year. Yes. He did not. Uh, it was not that way at NC State. He hit like a million home runs in the first two weeks. But but last year it was a slow start, and then obviously the numbers were there at the end. 2-2 two, two is up. Full count from Cade Fisher in his second season with his Florida team. Set the Georgia prep record for ERA. But he comes into this one 2-1 and one with a 7-9-4, his sixth start of the year. 3-2 is lifted foul. Well, and let's not forget about last year. Tommy was surrounded by some real dudes last year, right? And this year, he has seen a lot of all-speed pitches, especially early in the year. And he just kind of rolled over him, trying to do a little bit too much at times. And it's going to be up to Jared Jones, who's hitting behind him, to have a big year with a pitch to Tommy. Breaking ball stayed up and away, and a one-out walk to Tommy White. You mentioned it would be up to Jared Jones, hitting behind him, where he's hit in six out of seven and carries a 296 average into this at bat. Yeah, I mean, Jared Jones is the guy that got out of the gates quickly for LSU last year as a true freshman, made freshman All-American, racked up a lot of homers early, but when SEC play rolled around, he was outmatched at times and ended up not playing a whole lot down the stretch. And Jay Johnson got him plugged in this year. He's going to be the everyday first baseman. He has been so far. And the power numbers are really good. You're looking at eight homers and 21 RBIs. Batting average okay at 296. Sophomore from Marietta, Georgia, just outside of Atlanta and Walton High School, and a changeup to start it off to Get Jones swinging, nothing and one. Freshman All SEC team last year, third on the team in home runs and ribbies. Had a productive weekend against State and took that one off the knee. Two on and only one out. And that brings Hayden Travinsky up after a walk and a hit batter. Uh, for Kate Fisher, I mean, you got to try to establish fastball in, especially against these LSU hitters because the righties are going to climb all on top of him. But right there, I mean, that was about a foot and a half misfire yeah. with the fastball. And that just about went behind Jones. Yeah, it's some odd numbers for me for Cade Fisher this year. I mean, you look at his line last weekend against AM, one walk, 10 punch outs. I mean, that's big time, but yet gave up six runs. First pitch strike to Travinsky. In 333 with five home runs, senior from Shreveport, one of three different catchers. 
LSU will throw out there. He's hitting 455 with runners in scoring position this year. In for a strike. How big is the first inning? Obviously, I think it's big for Kate Fisher, but overall in this game, in this series. Well, I, I mean, I think it's massively important for him. Um, ultimately, inside again. Yeah, those misses glove side are <clears throat> not small. It's just, it's rare when we look at a Florida rotation on the weekend. A, that fr Friday night guy's not 92 to 96 with a wipeout slider. Fisher doesn't necessarily have that stuff. He's had plenty of swing and miss this year. And that ball's laced foul. It's just like Ben was saying. I mean, the, the hit, it, it's, a, it's a strange combination. Usually when you see a bunch of strikeouts, you don't see a bunch of hits. Because it's, it's usually an, an indicator of stuff that, yeah. that really plays well. And he's, he's not walking, guys. He's got no. five walks the whole year. 37 strikeouts against those five walks and 22 and two thirds. But to answer your question too, Tommy, I think it's important because both of these offenses so far this year have not been very good. LSU number one offense in the SEC last year. Florida number two offense. They're both sitting 10th and 11th this year in the SEC respectively. 20th pitch of the inning is a changeup swung on a miss. He needed that one. And now two down. So these offenses are, are really below average SEC standards right now. This is the really good breaking ball from Fisher here. Just kind of starts it a little bit off the outside corner and works it back. And so we're not used to seeing these offenses down towards the bottom of the SEC. So what I'm getting at, I think it's important for both of these teams to try to work ahead in this ball game. The difference is Florida is a big home run hitting team, a lot more than LSU. They can climb back in a ball game. Here's Josh Pearson to your point LSU middle of the pack in the league and average at 300 and 31 home runs to Florida's 44 Pearson junior from West Monroe. Got hot late last year really from middle of May on. This just his 17th start of this season and the breaking ball misses inside 2 and 0. Talking numbers, by the way, have you seen uh, Charlie Condon's numbers yeah. this year? Yeah, it, it looks man. like uh, video game numbers. I mean, we are leading the league in hits, home runs, total bases, on base percentage, slugging percentage, and an OPS above 1,800. And, and if I remember <laughs> right, it, he didn't have a great first SEC weekend, did he? Did they hold him to like one hit in, in the series? Yeah, he was fairly quiet. Well, yeah. I mean, they got three swept. Games. Kentucky swept him. Yeah. But, um, but it, the numbers before that were just, and they still are, just ridiculous. Fouled off two and two with the shift on against Josh Pearson. Well, he's not the only one with ridiculous numbers overall. The offensive numbers just spiking, even though the warm weather has really yet to arrive. In the 25th pitch of the inning for Fisher. No score in the first. And the 2 2 is golfed in foul territory on the right side. Caglione over to the wall. And that one's back to the concourse. Standing room only, by the way, on this Friday night. Busy weekend for LSU sports. And women's basketball team won its game just a few hours ago, a few blocks away over the PMAC, the NCAA tournament. Yeah, I'm sure there's a few folks here that enjoyed the basketball game and then made their walk over to the baseball field. 2 2 to Pearson. Fought that one off into left field. Tommy White around third. They're going to wave him home. The throw from Shellnut gets to the plate. The tag is late. An RBI single for Josh Pearson. And Ellis Jew strikes first. How about Tommy Wheels White making it home? Did he get in there? I don't know. I, I want to see this again. Yeah, I think everybody's going to see it again. I think they're going to look. Taking a chance on a backside ground ball. And White just Florida one stolen base attempt in the entire year. Testing the arm as shell not out left as the tag get there. Ooh. I can't tell I from mean, there. He, he doesn't get the plate with his feet. I mean, he's doing it intentionally. He's trying to just swipe it with that oven mitt on the way by. I didn't see a tag. There we go. If he clips him on the way by, he's out. If he gets him, I just didn't see a tag. I don't think the tag applies. Ball of safe stands. The runner has scored. Florida will have one remaining challenge. It's a no-brainer to challenge that if you're Kevin O'Sullivan. That was as close as it would get. Yeah, I, I think it's one of those ones. If it had been called out at home plate, I don't think you could have overturned this either. That's how close it was. Hey, 
And the first pitch low to Ethan Fry, who's making only his fourth start of the season and his first since March 9th. Six hits on the season, two of them doubles for Fry. Batting in the six hole for LSU. And Fisher. This is with that one, one ball, one strike, 353 average with seven ribbies. Ground ball through the hole on the left side. Jones be waved home. The throw from Shellnut is cut off, and LSU takes a 2 0 lead. There's so much that goes into a scouting report. It's not just about the guy on the mound. You start to look at the the arms in the outfield and Josh Jordan taking two chances right here with two outs. And really neither one of the guys are plus runners that you're trying to score from second base. I mean watch when Shelnut gets this ball. Shelnut gets Jones it. Jones is three steps yeah. before hitting third base. You, you got to have a chance there to throw him out. And that time they really did. And honestly, that's about as good a chance as you're going to get. When you got the yep. ball in your glove and in your hand as an outfielder, and the runner you're trying to throw out has not even reached third base yet, you would think. But you're right. The scout report goes in, and you can already see what LSD row was the average team ERA. That's where we are now. Roswell looks at a breaking ball 3-0. Because I'll tell you, there's some guys in college baseball right now with some unbelievable stuff, but mid-four ERAs. And you watch a pitch, you go, how does this guy giving up four and a half, five runs a game? But... We're getting back to the days to where a 4 ERA didn't yeah. get a look that bad at the end of the year. We're hitting more home runs on average than we were when the gorilla ball days were here. Four pitch for team's best players right out of the shoot. So navigating the first inning before you can get your rhythm is always the most difficult for me. And that's Heck. why you hope at some point you can just get through the first and throw a zero up, and then typically the rhythm begins to come. Paxton Kling at the plate, the eight hole hitter, Cade Fisher. Pitching with the bases loaded and two out. And the next two hitters, Kling and Milam, are combined two for their last 32. Kling is two for two with the bases loaded this year. The breaking ball misses low and in, two and one. What is working for Cade Fisher in this inning in terms of pitch selection? And what can he rely on right here? Um, I think his changeup is what he's most comfortable with right now. Time steals a strike with a glove side fastball right at the top of the zone, but I just I think the kid's mind is going a million miles an hour because you hit one, you walk one, and then you get two seven hoppers to go into left field. That's how you give up the two runs. Swing and a miss by Kling, and that'll get him out of the inning. But LSU Intimidators dates got just a little bit smaller font when they had to update it in the offseason. First pitch strike to Ty Evans from Luke Holman. Jay Johnson. Took Arizona to the College World Series Finals. Took Arizona to Omaha multiple times and then delivered what, right or wrong, Ben, what everybody expects in this fan base. Another trophy. Well, when Jay Johnson took over at LSU three years ago, he said, my goal is to bring LSU back to the forefront of college baseball. It took him two years to do it. Uh, and you guys know, I mean, relentless recruiter, doesn't sleep very often, as prepared as anybody to do it and, and Jay Johnson's done a really wonderful job in obviously a very high pressure situation here at LSU. Four K's for Luke Holman to go with one hit batter. Now Tyler Shell not coming to the plate. He's been hot over his last six. It was interesting. We met with Jay this morning. What was that 930 for a seven o'clock game. He's in the building with his entire staff and I said well what's normal for you and he said well I usually stay up late. I got my home set up. I got the office and all my screens. I can watch that Thursday night game and get my prep work done. He just the grind never stops with this guy. No, oh, he was here at seven this morning. <laughs> yeah, and look, that's not just this morning. From what yeah. I hear, it's it's every day he is here between six and seven o'clock, breaking down film, watching games. I remember talking to him at Omaha last year. I said, "How's it going?" He said, "Well, I'm sleeping about." Three hours a night because remember he was trying to find trying to win the national championship first of all. Then he was working the transfer and portal. Then, portal yeah. then he's trying to find a pitching coach. You know and trying to keep his recruits from going to the draft. You know and so it's it's a busy it's a tough time honestly to be a, a college head baseball coach right now. It is always busy. 
2 0 to Tyler Shellnut is upstairs with a fastball, three balls and no strikes. Shellnut got an OPS of 1164. 1163, pardon me. Game three, go ahead, two run home run in the bottom of the eighth against AM last weekend, and he works a one out walk. That'll bring Dale Thomas up. I think, you know, one other element that coaches didn't have to really deal with before is the transfer portal. And part of that is in season, in series, in game, not only watching your own team, but knowing what positions you may need to fill next year, keeping an eye on the other guys that are on the field in the other uniform and thinking to yourself, all right, well, is this guy going to be a fit for us down the road? First pitch behind Dale Thomas. Well, at the end of the year, trying to win a national championship at the same time. Yeah. Uh, not ideal. Thomas is senior transfer from Coastal Carolina. Played in 14 games with the Gators last year. Was second team all Sun Belt Conference with Coastal the year prior. Short lead for Tyler Shellnut. He's one of the few stolen base threats on this team for Florida. Three for three. And this ball is lifted deep and foul and out of play. Thomas one of two Coastal Carolina transfers on this Florida roster. You see where Florida comes in among class ranks. These are the SEC teams only. LSU coming in number two. They had the number one transfer class last year. Led by some guy named Skeens. I wonder what ever happened to him. Uh, he'll be in the big league some point in time this year. With the Pirates. Runner goes swing and a miss in the throw down to second. Skips through the glove of Milam and into center field. Can't charge an error on that play, but missed opportunity for Milo. Looked like the throw beat him, huh? The throw beat him, yeah. And he's it looked like he was going to get a short hop too, and and he did. Just tries to move the tag down a little bit before he has the ball. It's a, it's a different route, obviously, with the shift on. Milo's coming to second, a little different angle that he's used to. But yeah, he he gloves that one. Shell nuts out. Yeah, Trubinsky behind home plate for the Tigers tonight. Probably their third best, really catch and throw guy that they have. One two pitch to Thomas. Ooh, Missed wow. by much. Well, Luke Holman thought he had strike three, and so did Hayden Travinsky, the catcher for LSU. So two and two to Thomas. And he laces this one foul. Thomas is the second of three. Coastal Carolina transfers that Kevin O'Sullivan has brought into the program. Remember, BT Ryapel was behind the plate. He's like, it's like KP in his favorite hats. So if you got one, just keep going back to roll with it. If it feels good, wear it. Got him broke in. Shall not the runner at second, the 2 2. Whoa! Got it out of his hand to put a dent in the uh, padding. The wild pitch is the second of the season for Holman. They want to switch that one out. Yes. Slider that just zipped right out of his hand. Just missed. Shift down for the right hander Thomas, the payoff pitch. Take. And the break ball looks misses low and away. Back to back walks after. Recording the first four outs of the game via K. Yeah, unusual for Luke Holman because he is a strike thrower typically. I mean, five, these teams are too good to give extra opportunities to. Braswell's got six of them at shortstop. Breaking ball swung on a miss by Tanner Garris. Comparison, Florida's made 10 the whole year. Yeah, I mean, they're the number one fielding team in the SEC. Florida typically a very good defense. Here's the 0 1 from Holman. Runner goes from first, swing and a miss, and a stolen base for Dale Thomas. And that, that was why Jay Johnson went out. You got first and third, bottom part of the order right here. Garrison has not done a whole lot offensively, and I think the thought process was they're going to do something. Put him in motion, safety, obviously, right there. Dale Thomas steals his first bag of the year, and there's no way Trubinsky was going to throw. Garrison only making his eighth start of the season, two and two.
pardon yeah. me, one and two. And LSU going to play that defense back. They're going to concede the run. Strike three. Fifth K for Holman to go against those two strikeouts. Well, the good ones, guys, can find a way to elevate their game when it matters most. A guy over at first base. Holman haven't pitched to the inside part of the plate very often, but perfectly. You see Hayden Travinsky sets up right on the inside part of the plate and says, give me that heater right here and well executed by Holman. Fifth strikeout of the night. And here's Liberty transfer Jalen Guy. Fastball up and away. Guy's got plenty of experience. Four seasons at Liberty, 179 starts there. It's from Greensboro to Southeast Guilford High School. Not easy to replace a guy who was in center field last time these teams <laughs> met, who's already in the big leagues. Well, opening day. Pretty opening. cool day for Wyatt Langford. Not Get the news today, he's going to make the club. Swing and a miss, one and two. He'll be the second position player from last year's draft to make yep. it to the bigs. Yeah, and look, everybody knows the story. Last year when he went to the minor leagues, after he signed after the College World Series, tore up the minor leagues, so they bring him to big league camp with a chance. And he absolutely, I mean, one of the top home run guys in spring training in Major League Baseball this year. Guy looks at that pitch low, 94 mile an hour fastball. For the defending world champs, yeah. I mean, they were they were pretty good in the outfield last year. Shell not the runner third Thomas at second. Two two pitch to guy. Fastball off the plate full count. Yeah Luke Holman's command of that fastball not as sharp as it was his first four starts. You can see Hayden Travinsky gave the target. He wanted a belt high fastball there. But instead, it's kind of down and away. Here's the payoff to guy. Popped it up out of play behind the plate. Allman Jr. from Sinking Spring, Pennsylvania, at a Wilson High School, spent last year with Bama. Was a Friday night start with the Crimson Tide last season. Second in the league and whip, third in opponents batting at. And the veteran Jalen Guy fighting in this one. Seventh pitch of the AB. Again the payoff. Got him looking. Strikeout number six. Six. Yeah, Dylan Cruz, big spring training for the Nets. Well, you see Paul Skeens the other day in that prospects game against. <laughs> Against the Orioles. I think the first pitch was 100, then he went 101, 102 to get rid of <laughs> Enrique Bradfield Jr. Yeah. And then he faced Jackson Holiday, and Jackson Holiday was quoted after the game saying, I think he was throwing about 108 <laughs> miles an hour. That's what it looked like. Stephen Milam at the bottom of the order for LSU. Well, you can kind of see what Kate Fisher wants to do. I mean, he keeps wanting to get that fastball. To the inside part of the plate. That's kind of the scout report, and and, and Sully kind of told us that is that we're going to try to work the inside part of the plate with the fastball to LSU. Because like most college hitters, I mean, the, most guys look middle away. That's kind of where we are in college ball. Not a whole lot of guys throw inside consistently for strikes. Three and two, cutter right there, and LSU loaded it up with right-handers. I mean, eight of the nine in this lineup from the right-hand side, including the switch hitting Milam right here. 5'8 freshman from Las Cruces, New Mexico, and he pokes it to the right side for Kate Curlin. One down. All right, so take us through the mind of Kate Fisher. You, you had to labor through the first inning, 38 pitches, hit a batter, walked a couple. Yeah. Is it is it easy to hit the reset button when you come back out? I don't think it is for him now, just because it's it's kind of been one of those years where you look at it and go, okay, what's gonna go wrong next? Um I mean, it wasn't like they were hitting it off the wall in the first inning. He created his own issues and then a couple of ground ball singles end up scoring a couple runs. So he's not getting hit that hard. Pitch count's going way up already, though. Mac Bingham at the plate. Started with a ground out to third to open the first for LSU. Three and 
three and zero. And Tanner Garrison trying to get his guy focused. He's already made one trip to the mound that came in the first. Guides one in for a strike three and one back to back three oh counts to start the second inning for Cade Fisher. With that inside strike full count. Bingham spent four seasons in Tucson playing for Arizona was a. Uh, all conference performer in the Pac-12 last year and he chops one to short. Short hop pickup beauty by Shelton two down. And with the base is empty Tommy White comes to the plate carrying a seven game hit streak. At the plate for LSU, 30 Tommy White. Six home runs 21 driven in four consecutive games of the long ball for White. Tommy White did not play in the fall was coming off a of band surgery that he underwent just five days after the College World Series. And with Jay Johnson earlier this, today he said he didn't play in the fall but he was engaged every practice working through every group. And he skies this one but got underneath it. Caglione of foul territory. Coming okay, back to the chalk. So one trip to the order for Holman and those six K's and he starts Cade Curlin off with a breaking ball nothing in one. Curlin struck out in the first four home runs he's driven in 13 on the season. What's the difference between the Holman breaking balls. Well ball, go ahead. Yeah one's curveball one's a slider. If you watch the curveball it's got more of a shape of a, yeah. almost a 12 to 6 and then that slider's kind of moving a little bit horizontal has some vertical in it too but moving a little bit horizontal in the mile per hour about five miles an hour difference. Did you throw two. In the Did big leagues I, in the big leagues I threw a cutter and a curveball yeah. but in college it was just curveball forkball fastball changing. The old forkball. I never could master the curveball and the slider because I felt like they yep. kind of morphed into one, and that's why I, I came up with a cut fastball, which is easy to throw versus trying to throw a slider and a curveball. Here's the 2 2 to Curly. Jammed wow. him, and off of the knuckles, it'll trickle foul. And, and that was release point, grip, all of it? Yeah, the slider and the curveball is, is similar to throw, and, and that's why a lot of guys have trouble. Now, Obviously, the pitch that a lot of guys are throwing now is a sweeper, and that's a little bit different because of the seam shifted wake and how the ball moves and all that kind of stuff. You're seeing some guys be able to master the curveball and the slider now. The sweeping slider is what we call it. But yeah, I never could get both of those going because you're still throwing the side of the hand in both of them, so it was a little bit more difficult. Ben just went next level on yes. us. Three and two Seems to curl. shifted weight. Yeah, that's all this, this new technology that we got out. We understand. And listen, the sweeping slider's been around. Everybody makes a big yeah, deal like it's, it's a not new pitch. New. But it's the same pitch that, uh, you know, Chris Sale's been throwing for 15 years and Randy Johnson threw too. It's just now we understand why the balls move like they move. There's a breaking ball and strikeout number seven with the throw time up. Nine strikeouts and 87 at bats this season for Caglione. And the scouting report tells you he usually swings at that first pitch. Curveball in the dirt, 2 0. Oh. Yeah, there's a lot of things that impress me about Caglione, but the ability to hit the left handers, too. I mean, he's almost yep. equally as good against left handed pitching as he is right handed pitching. I know there's a lot of talk about him on the mound, and I do like him on the mound. It, as obviously, it's a big arm. But for me, and what I've seen this year, and you talked about not striking out as much, walking a little bit more, better understanding of the strike zone. And I'm telling you what, some of the plays he has made defensively for yes. the Florida Gators, he's a big league first baseman all day long, in my opinion. SEC preseason player of the year, 2-1. and one. It's why he's pitching on Sundays. It's the only reason he's pitching on Sundays. So he can play first base. Friday Saturday then we'll start game three of the series because he's he's a run saver over there first. Two one. Chase it upstairs at 93 33 home runs to lead the nation last year. Let's see if Holman goes back to that 12 to 6 curveball. 
Fastball up normally sets up that breaking ball. They've got the shift on for Caglione. Steven Milam is playing in short right. <laughs> Can he throw him out from there? Here's the payoff. And there's that curveball, but it stayed up. Third walk from Luke Holman and brings Luke Heyman to the plate. What do you think Mike Rivera is telling him right now? He's telling him, do not steal. You have to pitch Sunday. We don't want you <laughs> to you bust up your out ankle. Right by me. I want you to take just a very average to below average lead, and when they hit it, you run. He probably said, hey, listen, verbatim right there. I've got a great joke. I'm only going to give you one line at a time. You have to keep coming back to me for the punch. <laughs> if you run, you're one. not going to hear it. That's right. The shift down for Heyman. Mark Wanaka handles all of the defensive alignments for this LSU program. And the pitching under first year pitching coach Nate Yeski came over from Texas A&M, one and two. And previously with Jay in Arizona for yeah. a few years. So they, they've worked together, know each other well. Nate's been a great fit. Like, it's kind of a great fit everywhere has been. Including national championship seasons at Oregon State. One two pitch. Fought it off. Yeah Nate Yeski is the only active assistant coach in college baseball. To take three different programs to the College World Series obviously won it with Oregon State. Went there a couple of times with Oregon State once with A&M. Once with Arizona. Fouled off one and two. How many different styles of pitching coaches exist in the game today? I think there's still a fair amount. I mean, you still there's some old school guys that are still around. I think Frank Anderson would definitely fit that at, at Tennessee. Um, there's plenty of swing and a miss on the off speed pitch. I mean, obviously you go from West Johnson who was here last year, now the head coach of Georgia who is as advanced analytically as, as any college pitching coach. Nate's right there. I mean, it's it's very similar. But then you, you got to have the ability to dumb it down for everybody else. At this point, you just got to have the ability to keep calling the breaking ball if Holman's out there. But um, there are less, hey, I'm not going to look at the analytical guys now. Um, which makes sense because a lot of these kids are growing up and, and that's the information that they understand at a fairly young age. Yeah, I mean watching Wes Johnson last year. I felt like as you mentioned heavy heavy analytical guy and that's what attracted the Minnesota Twins to Wes Johnson yeah. to be the pitching coach. When I look at Nate Yeski, I see a guy that understands analytics, but also as you mentioned more of an old school guy that can tell you, okay, these are the analytical numbers, but this is how what you have to do mechanically to get those balls in these certain spots to have success. And so I think Nate is a and I think that's where a lot of coaches pitching coaches are trying to get understand the analytics, yeah. be able to explain it, teach it, but also be really aware of the mechanical side and how to get balls to certain quadrants of the strike zone. 2 to Colby Shelton who struck out his first time up and missed on the fastball two and one. Ben you've been in spring training with the Orioles. I imagine a lot of the young pitchers who are coming up these days demand all of the same stuff mm -hmm. that they had at major colleges whether it be relying on track men every training session it, it felt like. MLB teams were a step behind the college teams in some aspects. Yeah, no, I think there's a lot of truth to that, you know. And it, it's, you know, the game has changed so much with these Edgetron cameras, slow motion cameras, and then track man numbers and all the things that we have out there, right? It's amazing to me. You go to spring training and there'll be five pitchers throwing, five catchers down there catching their bullpen sessions. And behind each pitcher on the mound is the Edgetron camera and the track man. And every pitch, and there's a guy with a computer behind every guy. And it's amazing. A pitcher throws a pitch and says, what was the spin rate on that? How much vertical break did I get on that? What was the horizontal break on that? Okay, I'm going to change the grip a little bit and let's see if we can improve it. And so it's, and then it goes into a memory bank and then they'll break down their session after the bullpen session. They'll talk about, okay, this grip worked better. You got 18 inches of vertical break on this. You had 14 inches of horizontal. This is the, where we want the ball. And so it's changed a lot from where it, what, what it used to be. Third full count of the inning. 
Shelton swings at the fastball and it's strikeout number nine. Just three off of Holman's and he'll miss. And the first pitch is rocketed to right field. And a line out for Jared Jones, one down. I thought Mike Rooney put it pretty well. He was talking about Mississippi State's weekend and he said, I just kind of feel like they fell into this funk where they almost like a funk of pity and they were just waiting to come out of it. And for two years that lasted before they came back. And of course, Ole Miss kind of fell into that funk for one year after their national title. Well, college baseball is better when Ole Miss and Mississippi State are players in the postseason. There's no doubt, doubt about that. Hayden Travinsky launches this one to center field. Guy drifting back towards the right field wall and a leaping catch. Two down. Quick two for Fisher. Why do you say that about Ole Miss and State? Just the fan bases, the fan bases that they that they have, and are you know, I mean, you talk about State, and you talk about Ole Miss, you talk about, you know, probably two of the best fan bases in all of college baseball. You know, right there with, with, with LSU, and maybe a couple other programs. So it's just better. And look, both those programs, you know, make up the rhythm of Fisher, through 14 pitches in the second, two here in the third after 38 in the first. Pearson with an RBI single on the backside, his first time up. One on one. But for state, too, I mean, it's not like there's no off weekends in this league, but you start with the defending national champs at home the first week in SEC play, and then you got to go to AM. I mean, AM was one of the last two undefeated teams in the country. So Florida beat them last weekend. Tell your friends you're on national television. Nah, that's my kid. State leads AM 5 1 in the seventh. Pitch is low 2 and 2. And Tennessee hammering Ole Miss tonight 15 to 3 so far. Yeah. Pearson's got a six game hit streak now, nine for his last 20. Make it 21. Seven pitch inning for Cade Fitt. Jay Johnson's LSU team has a 2 nothing lead in the third. Tom Hart, Ben McDonald, Kyle Peterson. Jay, when you went and got Luke Holman to um, get out of the transfer portal and put an LSU jersey on, what were you expecting from him? What's his ceiling? Well, Friday night, these games are going to be tight, as we can see, and he's going to give you a chance. He did it all last year at Alabama and just preparing for him. I think he's got the pitch ability, the makeup, everything you need to pitch in a, a game like this. Coach, if, if you had to improve, I know, uh, you're trying to improve all facets of the game, but what's the, really the number one thing you want to try to improve from this point forward? Yeah, I think it's, it's a few things. Just staying committed to our plan on offense. I think we've really improved in the last three games. We saw some of that early in the game. We have to be able to stick with that against a good pitcher like Fisher. Just concentration stuff on defense. We've got a lot of different guys in new spots, and our pitchers got to pitch with conviction. they got to fill up the zone, and Luke's doing a great job striking guys out. We want him to keep getting ahead like that. No doubt. Jay, thanks for your time. Best of luck this weekend. All right, guys. Thank you. Jay Johnson is pitcher Luke Holman. Nine strikeouts through three innings pitched. Facing Ty Evans now, who he struck out in the second. Now, the shift has not come into play because, well, Florida <laughs> hasn't put a ball in play. No. However, Ben, am I am I wrong or is LSU shifting even more this season than they did last? No, I, I feel like you're right. I mean, almost every batter would feel like there's some type of shift either to the pool side or, or – or, you know, back to the other side when the left-handers come on. So, so let me ask you this: Then, as it portends to tonight for both of you guys, if you're a strikeout pitcher, does the shift give you confidence to attack one certain spot more than another? Does it allow you any more freedom as a strikeout pitcher, I, or only guys who pitch a contact? I would say if if the shift ultimately makes you do things differently. Pearson all the way back to the fence and that one is gone opposite field home run for Ty Evans. Felt like a lazy fly ball and it clears the fence for Evans fifth home run of the year. Evans has plenty of juice. I mean we saw it last year with his Florida lineup. And the Gators just needed something. I mean you had said just a minute ago Tommy they hadn't even hit a ball fair until this he, he didn't get all of it what win there is tonight it's going to help out right there blowing kind of from left field foul pole to right field foul pole I thought it was a routine fly ball I, I think uh, Josh Pearson did too but instead it's a solo shot and it's a one run game 
And a breaking ball low and away. First hit of the game for the Gators leaves the yard. Here's Tyler Shelnut. Well, this is what the Gators do to you. I mean, don't forget, led the nation last year in homers with 146 of them. And look, in their projected lineup before the season began, they brought back 117 home runs into their projected lineup for this year. Milam handles that one. One down. So that's a lot of long balls. By the way, Tennessee has hit five home runs tonight. Fourth time this season they've hit five or more. Georgia has three games with six home runs or more. They had one of them this week, but they got swept opening weekend. Shift on for Dale Thomas, two home runs, 13 driven in. And Thomas got underneath it. Long run for Milam into shallow right, called off, and play made by Pearson. It's a lot with Tanner Garrison coming up. Yeah, talking about the home runs and the runs being scored, like, for me, I don't know how you guys feel about it, but it's almost not gotten fair for pitchers the last few years. And where we're trending right now, I'm wondering if it's time to step in Maybe not to the degree we stepped in last time just, when we totally killed the offense, but for me, something, yeah, something that we can go back to the, the higher seam baseball. Got a little bit That's more drag to it. Or, or you could open the zones back up to more of a traditional yep. strike zone than what we see in the college game because we've not had that traditional college strike zone the last couple of years. I think that's also a big reason why we're seeing the offense balloon like it is. Well, one of the reasons we haven't is the advent and the universal usage of trackman technology which is what these guys are judged on right don't we all feel that the strike zone got a little bit more professional in many ways like MLB oh, size once it got to track man? No, no doubt it almost felt like a double a triple a strike zone uh, and it is again this year you know and the truth is is our college pitchers command wise they aren't as good as the big league guys to pitch though and then you take the equipment that's out there now this is not the bat that was introduced in the BB core bat era years ago this is a different kind of bat that's being used right now so yes in my opinion something needs to be done to deaden the offense just a shade Tanner Garrison fouls one straight back just missed the fastball just to play devil's advocate what's what's the problem with more offense like where is the tipping point where offense gets well, too hot. The one thing I'm concerned about is exit velos. And way back when, when we talked about, and the NCAA said, hey, exit velos are a little bit high right now. It's getting to be dangerous. But we're. All right, Dari, thank you. Great to see you in studio tonight. It's a 1 0 count as we move to the bottom of the fourth inning to Ethan Fry. Drove in a run with a seeing eye single in the first. And the off speed pitch is in there for a strike from Cade Fisher, 1 and 1. 15 runs they hit six times as <laughs> they run ruled them at home. So we're just talking about the explosion of offense have been a chance to extrapolate on the uh, dangers of the exit velo. Yeah so the NCAA told us years ago when they put the BB core bat in play they were worried about the exit velos and dangers to of course the pitcher being the closest guy to the batter and that was a concern and that was one of the reasons that they wanted to deaden the offense just a little bit. Well, now we're creating edge velos, honestly, that are exceeding what the biggest, strongest, best hitters in the world at the, at the big league level are exceeding exit velocity. And so, to me, that's a little bit uh, of a problem and a concern for sure. When, when guys are starting to hit balls off the bat, 118, 119, 120 off the bat, it, it's got to be a little bit concerning. Full count to Ethan Fry. A little dribbler foul. KP, were you, whether it was a college or professional ball, were you ever nervous in terms of batted balls? Was that a concern when you're on the mound? First college game I ever pitched in was at Fullerton. I came out of the bullpen, and Mark Kotze hit a screamer right back in and hit me right in the quad that I could feel for the next year, honestly. I still I could knew exactly where it hit me. High chopper handled over a third by Dale Thomas. Perfect positioning and the throw retires Fry. A little gun shy. Like, all right, this is a little bit different than playing American Legion ball. Miller South back <laughs> home. Um, they don't have any cotsays there. So why hasn't health and safety, which the NCAA 
in many ways you could argue over regulates for yeah. good reason. Why hasn't that come up in conversation on the baseball side of things in recent years? Mm, I only think I, I can figure they wanted more of a sample size of what's going on in offense and they're getting that sample certainly the last two or three years you know and so the other piece of that is when you have 18 to 12 ball games you have a three and a half hour game major league baseball did a lot of studies the last couple of years the average fan likes a two and a half hour ball game that's when your audience is at its best and wants to watch a ball game nobody wants to see a three and a half hour ball game Major League Baseball, as you guys know, put in some rule changes last year, sped the game up a little bit. Braswell lines this one into left. He'll motor his way to second. The throw from Shellnut is a hair wide, and it's a one-out double from Michael Braswell the third. And, and, and so going back to that point, you know, it's uh, you know, take a look at Michael Braswell, who, you know, Jay Johnson totally broke down. Braswell comes from South Carolina, was there for two years, played shortstop, pitched his first year, a little bit of a reliever as well. And Michael Braswell had the best batting average in fall for LSU. Jay Johnson got him on campus, totally broke down his swing, told him, I'd like to have you here at LSU, but I'll, if you come, I'm going to totally break you down, and I'm going to change your swing a little bit and do some things. And Braswell wanted to listen and has been a solid player. The defense was never an issue with Braswell. It was about the offensive side of the ball. I'm going to tell you something. I, I think that's something that Jay does as good as any college coach, and that's teach. Um, obviously, he can recruit. He's, he's done it everywhere he's been, but he is a great teacher of the game. Paxton Kling takes a strike, nothing and two. Seven hole hitter, probably eight hole hitter, Paxton Kling struck out his first time up. How does teaching manifest itself in season versus when you have fall to really work on stuff especially mechanically I think one way it does is trust to where if if you're in a rut or if if you know anybody on the coaching staff sees something that, that maybe needs to be addressed guys trust voices like Jay a lot more during the season and then I, I think you're more apt to say okay I'm, I'm willing to listen and willing to do that yeah, and it's hard to argue with Jay's success, right, as a hitting coach and what he's been able to accomplish. Obviously, he's the head coach, but he takes care of all the hitting stuff at LSU. And he had some big-time performances when he was at Arizona. Arizona was always towards the top in offense and batting average, and he's kind of brought that over to LSU. He teaches patience. And, you know, his deal, if you watch him, is his guys are going to take a lot of pitches. His idea is he wants to get the pitch count up from the opposing starter very early like he did in this ballgame. So you'll see him make his guys take – work the counts in certain situations, and then once they see a guy through the lineup the first or second time, then he'll turn them loose, and you'll see LSU hitters start to attack some first pitches, but he wants them to really get knowledge of how the fastball moves, the velocity, how the breaking ball moves, and change up, work the pitcher a little bit, and then attack later on in the ballgame. Catcher Tanner Garrison needed a moment to catch his breath. Count two and two. Braswell, the runner at second. And Ooh. couldn't pull the trigger. Kling punched out. Oh, this is this is money right here. Most college hitters are taught to wait a little bit with two strike counts, protect against the all-speed pitch. And when you can throw the heater right on the inside part of the plate like that, it is going to be money more times than not, and nothing Kling can do about that. I love pitchers that finish with the fastball in with two strikes. Fourth K for Fisher, now the nine-hole hitter. Steven Minum. Minum is just a freshman. He's at a Centennial High School in Las Cruces, New Mexico. KP, his nickname is Monster for a guy who's 5'8, 172. I like it. Yeah, and that's 5'8. You know where it we comes from? Ben Tiny. That's 5'8 and spikes, too, I promise you. He picked up the nickname pretty early. I mean, like, Day one of his life because he was born, according to his parents, a hairy little monster. <laughs> to short, <laughs> Shelton handles it. First haircut came when he was three days. I got you. Hey, we got Kevin O'Sullivan with us. Quick backstory: When we were with you uh, before BP, you talked about placing your third baseman in the perfect spot. Dale Thomas got a ground ball to him to begin that inning that was exactly what you talked about. And my question is not about this field or how it plays or how you move guys around. But in your years in this league, how much does your experience pay off and just little things like that? 
Yeah, I mean, you know, you just kind of watch over the years, and every, you know, every field's different, and every you know um, situation's different. But you know, there's a lot of balls that are hit in front of home plate that are dirt to dirt. So, like we said before the game, you know, third baseman's got to make a decision. He's got to play in, or he's going to play back. That in-between position is really tough in the uh, field when it's when it, when it goes dirt to dirt. Hey, sell it with Kate Fisher. I mean, it was a little bit of bad luck in the first. I know he created some of his own issues, but um, since then, it seems like he's found it pretty good. What What have you seen these last three innings as opposed to the first? Um, he's commanding his fastball better on the inner half, not trying to do too much. Obviously, a lot of their hitters like to stand on top of the plate, and he's starting to get his breaking ball going, his slider. Uh, I know we gave him a double of Brazzle on the changeup, but he's just been locating better, and I think the, the last inning there where he got – um, two outs on two pitches that kind of saved him an inning. So hopefully he will continue to do what he's doing. Sully, thanks for your time. We appreciate it. Thanks, thanks guys. How about Kevin guy. O'Sullivan, guys? How about this, though? It's yep. hard to argue that Florida's not been the best college program in the country the last 15 years. 15 full seasons at Florida, eight trips to the College World Series out of 15 years, a national title, and played for two more in the championship. That's how good Florida and Kevin O'Sullivan has been over the last 15 years. They have won 20 of their last 22 three game series. Here's Kate Curlin at the top of the order. I, I want to explain that first question. We were talking with him pregame and he talked about positioning his third baseman as he alluded to you either got to play in or play back because there's dirt at the plate and it's a dirt infield right. And he said uh, I, I go well, did you guys pick that up practicing here last night and he goes no I I've known that for years you haven't been here in five years. He said yeah well the field hasn't changed I know it just seems like that is a minor thing and maybe it only comes into play three times this weekend. But it you already did once it already did once but you would think KP that there are innumerable little nuggets in the back of his baseball brain yeah. by being in this league so long to come into play. I just think there's certain coaches players whoever that are around this game that, that the game just talks to them a little bit different. I mean Ben you play with one of those guys in the big leagues for a long time. Um, and so often it maybe isn't the big stuff that they're noticing more than anybody else. It's it's stuff like that and, and oversimplify what he's saying is yeah. at this ballpark with right handed hitters there's a lot of times that that rollover ground ball once it hits the dirt is is ultimately it's not going to hit the grass before your third baseman fields it. So if we're even with the bag I'm going to get it on the first hop playing deep enough. We're not going to get that tweener. It gives you a little bit more time to react to a, a good hop as Holdman punches out his, his 11th of the night already. How about this coming into the inning even after the start that Fisher had in the first both Holman and Fisher 78 total pitches 45 strikes. You would not have thought that right. No. Caglione swung at the first for the first time and now 0 and 2. Hit by pitch in the first drew a walk in the third. Here's the 0 2 from Holman. Now the one two to Caglione. And he drives this one to center field back is cling. The park is going to hold it shy of the track. A long loud out for Jack Caglione but Holman is one K away. One month Sully. You often forget what the game summary does but not with you. Simple and to the point. And like Mac Bingham's first name is just Mac. And Mac looks at a ball just inside 101. All right, so Sully talked about Cade Fisher's road to recovery after that lengthy first inning. KP, what have you seen? Uh, he has controlled the fastball a lot better. I think that's that's the start of it. Um, I mean, he's only given up one hit since the first inning, so there hasn't been a lot of loud contact for LSU the entire night. They just hit him in the right spot in the first. Breaking ball for a strike two and two. And Bingham off the hand, shallow left field. 
And the catch made on the run by Colby Shelton. Ben, they're going back to that same approach. Um, and Sully talked about it that LSU's right handed hitters, and it's eight of the nine in this lineup, are climbing up on top of the plate. He's had the ability over the last few, and he's stick the fastball in late. Got a strikeout looking. Last inning on Kling, and then right there, got that fastball in on Bingham's hands. Yeah, and I love the fact that it was a breaking ball before that that slowed that bat down a little bit, and then back to the inside part of the plate with that heater. That is a deadly combination. Tommy White nubs one to the right of the mound. Glove by Fisher. Take that every chance you can get against Tommy White. Two down. Yeah, now Kate Fisher has a changeup. He only uses about 8% of the time, but after he's done so much work with that heater on the inside part of the plate, eventually these LSU hitters are going to start trying to cheat a little bit. They're going to get that foot down a little bit, open up, and try to get the barrel to the inside part of the plate to that fastball. Now, if he can start to incorporate that changeup, which is his third best pitch, and I think that's what that was right there. It looked mm -hmm. like a changeup right off the cap to Tommy White. Three hole hitter Jared Jones looks at a strike, nothing in one. On away, one ball, one strike. Jones was hit by a pitch in the first, lined out to right field in the third. Two one. Swing and a miss. And of course, that's a difference maker, too. 2 1 breaking ball, fastball count, lands the breaking ball just like he did to Bingham in a 2 1 count. Two twos right down the gut. Changed the bridge. The six inning starts with the Luke Heyman pop up and out of play. Do the bridges have names or just new and old? I think we just call that the Mississippi River Bridge or the New Bridge. New Mississippi River Bridge. 11 K's for Luke Coleman. This ball laced foul into the Florida bullpen. Action in the LSU bullpen. Herring getting loose. Ben, does anybody anybody fish the Mississippi River up here? Yeah. Yeah. What do you find in it? Mostly catfish, but, uh -huh. there, but there's some big catfish down there. Heyman's Cade twice, fouled straight back. How big? Bigger than humans from what we've been told. There was a guy that went down working on some pipes down at the Mississippi River right there by the new bridge some years ago, and he tells a story about going down, and there were catfish down there as big as he was. And it made him very, <laughs> very nervous. Well, I understand why they would make him nervous, but I, I believe your description leaves a little to the imagination because you say as big as humans. I'm not sure if you're aware humans come in all shapes and sizes. You know, if you found a catfish as big as Stephen Milam, that'd be a big catfish. Well, they're bigger than Stephen Milam. They're probably about the size of Tommy White. That's big. That's big. It's, it's a good size catfish. 12 Ks for Luke uh, Coleman. How, how's, our, uh, how's our pond looking? On the farm, I didn't. I didn't Good. get the update this year of, of when you dropped all the crawfish in. There. Well, there's been a problem with the crawfish, and, okay. and because of the drought last year, the crawfish farmers have really been struggling here in Louisiana. Not nearly as many crawfish available. Prices have not come down yet. They're catching a few, but they're not catching what they typically catch this time of year. We had an awful drought down here uh, in the Baton Rouge area and in the southeast last year, and Colby. it hurt the crawfish big time. 0 oh, 1 to Colby Shelton, who's over 2 with a couple of K's, and Holman has now set a career high with 12 strikeouts. You, you say catching crawfish, right? That looks good. Oh, there we go. Found a few of them. Are crawfish generally, what, what percentage of crawfish that are consumed come from farms versus in the wild? Well, typically this time of the year, early in crawfish season, and it begins around January, most of the crawfish you get are going to be what we call pond crawfish, which is where those come from. And not, then hard to, not hard to catch, is my point. You, you kind of know they're there. Yeah, but they, they're they not there this year like they have been in the past because the drought killed a lot of them. Because the water level was The so water low. level was bad, yes. 
That was that was washing crawfish right there. So they catch them and they wash them. They Holman. wash them up real good and they ship them off. Holman has struck out 13. And those right there are boiled and ready to consume. How many crawfish you think you've eaten in your life? Uh, I'd be scared to know. Well, that's why I'm asking. I want to know. A lot. I, when I sit down and eat crawfish, like it's nothing to eat 10, 12, maybe 15 pounds of crawfish. Like if I'm if I'm eating pounds? to get full. Pounds, yes. In a in one sitting? Absolutely. Floyd's going to have a big old batch ready for us tomorrow, right here in the park. Looking forward to it. I actually had some boiled crawfish for the first time today. They were very good. Ty Evans homeward in the fourth inning, lone run of the night for Florida. 15 pounds. I mean, you've, you've seen Ben McDonald eat the tomahawk steak, so that should be no big surprise, but that takes a lot of work. Yeah, but 15 food. pounds of crawfish is not really 15 pounds of meat, obviously. I'm mean, only eating the tail meat. 100th pitch of the night from Holman is low and away. How many crawfish would make up 15 pounds? 150? Uh, depending on the size this year right now they're they're probably small to mediums and as the season goes forward they'll become medium to large and so and it's typical as we all do yeah in a typical sack of crawfish, <laughs> just the crawfish you know and we should be talking to Eric Ketzel who played baseball here years ago at LSU and is listening tonight but he's a crawfish farmer so he catches his own crawfish and he's also a crawfish distributor as well he buys other farmers crawfish and then he sells them out to restaurants and places and whatever huge business here in Louisiana well count to Evans Holman has already set a career high with 13 K's here's his 103rd pitch of the night and it's foul back Holman was the ace at Alabama last year. He's the Friday night starter at LSU this year. 3 2 again. Chopped to the left side. Here's Tommy White. And the sixth is complete. A career high 13. They got their hands full with Auburn. Yeah, Auburn needs a win. Swept the opening weekend. Hagen Smith beat him one nothing last night. Well, Hagen Smith, huh? Yeah. Oof. Oof. Leads the country in strike. At least he did before Chase Burns went out today. And that's after his first outing of the season. Yeah, where he got resulted in three yeah. outs total. Hayden Travinsky 0 for two. And this one launched foul. That is a push broom of a stash for Hayden Trevinsky. <laughs> and he's got a flavor saver down low. Best of both worlds, two and two. He'd be tasting the crawfish two days after, wouldn't <laughs> yeah. he? Yeah, he could stuff a couple of tails in that mustache. You'd hide a few. Ben, you ever had a mustache? No, I haven't. Um, I tried to grow one my senior year in high school and it had like seven hairs on my top <laughs> lip and I just I don't know I can't still can't grow one. Trubinsky pulls it down the line it's a fair ball Sheldon has to dig it out of the corner. Trubinsky will lumber into second with a leadoff double in a one run game. Well, Kate Fisher had set down 13 of 14 before this one the only Base runner in the midst of that was the Braswell double. This is something LSU has not done all night. Let's get the leadoff man on. Travinsky yeah. hooks it just inside the third base bag, and he's standing on second base. They got a base runner in scoring position with nobody out here in the sixth. Well, LSU is seeing Fisher for the third time through the lineup, and after getting pounded with heaters on the inside part of the plate, you're starting to see him cheat a little bit and try to get the head to the ball. And Travinsky, a very nice job. With a stand in the heart of and they do try to get it down, but it's pushed foul. Nothing in one. That was right when Fisher really got a roll. Ben only three sacks in the season for LSU. Is that a byproduct of the non-conference schedule? Or I more? 
I think so. I mean, obviously with a with a new team and a new lineup, you know, LSU and, and, and of course, Jay Johnson's trying to figure out you know, what what players give him his best chance offensively. But this is a part of LSU's game. I mean, 144 homers last year, second in the country. They bunted a few times last year when it called for that situation. Pearson hit by a pitch, two on with Ethan Fry coming up. Fry one for two tonight, including a two out single to play the second run of the game for LSU. That's back in the first. Getting 750 with runners in scoring position. And he pulls back on that attempt. Fisher's next pitch will be his 100th. Now Fisher threw 109 pitches a week ago. Two and one. Florida has only turned seven double plays this season. And this ball's launched into center field. Guy racing into the gap at the track at the wall, and it's off the middle of the fence. Headed to third is Travinsky, and that's all the farther the catcher will advance. LSU has loaded the bases with nobody out in the sixth. On the second hit of the game for Ethan Fry. And just his fourth start of the season. Yeah, hey, Travinsky here got kind of caught in no man's land at second base. He thought that on average. And the first one to Braswell misses low and away. Michael Braswell, the third, with the bases loaded this year. Three for four, ten driven in. A couple of singles and a triple. And he's on a five game hit streak coming into this plate appearance. 2 and 0. Three and 0. By the way, for Slater, seven of his 11 appearances have been scoreless. Travinsky, the runner, third. Pearson is at second. And after a shot off the wall, Ethan Fry at first base. Here's the 3 0. Goes to a fastball for a strike. 3 1 slider? Uh, he's thrown it plenty. Braswell doubled his last time up. Bases juiced and fastballs in for a strike full count. That's kind of where the fastball is going to sit velocity wise. What's odd about it, it throws a lot more sliders as KP mentioned, but opponents only hitting 158 off the fastball. And the sliders in the dirt, ball four, and he walks in a run, an insurance run at least for LSU. And one charge to Fisher. Paxton Kling is due up. Jay Johnson give him a few last minute bits of advice before he comes to the plate. You think he just said slider, slider, slider? Yeah, I mean. The that's numbers the say, says. yeah, the numbers say that's what you're going to get. You might as well, when you get, you know, OO counts or counts in your favor. And pitchers have tendencies, no reason not to sit on the ball on the outside part of the plate or outer third and be at a breaking ball and try to get it the other way. 1 0. Oh. One and one. Are most of his sliders going to be out of the zone? He gets a fair amount of chance. Uh -oh. Whoa, this one's launched deep to left. It is caught at the wall by Shell, not tagging from third. Pearson. 
And if the wind is dead or not going that way, that's a four bag. Well, there was a slider that was in the zone. And Slater's lucky that that one stayed in the ballpark because just enough off the end of the bat. I think Paxton Klink still thought he got enough of it. Some of the 10,000 plus that were standing behind it, but deep enough to score a run. So just going to go as a sack fly for Kling, but it adds another one. LSU with two more here now in the sixth. And it brings Milam to the plate. Milam is grounded out twice. Misses up and away with a fastball. Where's the bunt? If you're Slater and your slider are heavy, how does that change against the first lefty? He doesn't throw quite as many to lefties from a percentage standpoint, but he still throws the slider more than the fastball to left handers. Um, I mean, that's that's the one when he's right. That's the one that he trusts the most. And now the changeup. Two one from Slater and for a strike two and two. Fries at second Braswell at first. Chopped up the middle. Tough play on the run made by Curlin. No chance for two and both runners advance. Fry now at third and Braswell at second, two down. All right, Slater has faced three batters. He has yet to throw a first pitch strike. Back to the top of the order, Mac Bingham. Bingham is 0 for 3. 1 and 0. Fastball good enough for Slater to help him out tonight. I think to Ben's point, I mean, his outcome on the fastballs have, have been positive this year. Chopped to third, off of the glove of Thomas, and a run scores. We talked about positioning over third base multiple times tonight. That's the very ball that Kevin O'Sullivan was talking about. Is the ball he said it goes dirt to dirt so often. Just because it's it's hard out in front of home plate, man, and and so if you're playing close to even with the bag right now, it's going to get over your head. Thomas just not playing quite deep enough. Had to backpedal it, even if he gloves it. I'm not sure if he's got the ability to make the throw over. So it'll go as an RBI single right there for Bingham. The Tigers add another one. Yeah, and I don't know that he had came in because Milam did show bunt at one point. So maybe he was thinking, even in the two strike count, that he could put the bunt down and kind of got him caught in no man's land. And now you got to face Tommy White with two out. Slater thought he had a strike, one and zero. Oh. Want to get behind of this guy? Home runs in four consecutive games. Swing and a miss on the changeup. The entire crowd gasped. Watch White's approach here. Then if he gets to two strikes, watch how that stance will change a little bit. He'll widen out even more and swing that front foot open. Not doing it yet. Two and one. Yeah, and what's odd about Tommy White, normally when guys really spread out with two strikes, it's more of a controlled swing, but he still finds a way to punish the baseball even spread out. Hot shot to third. Thomas has it. Only needs to go to first, and that'll close the inning. But not before LSU puts a three spot on them. If you got him, spin him. If you got him, and boy, he had two breaking balls. Two really good breaking balls. Shellnut said he got hit in the foot. He seems to be the only one that saw it. Now, Kevin O'Sullivan will use his second challenge to look at it. Let's see. Yeah. Yep. 
Florida has challenged potential hit by pitch. This play will be under review. You know, from a context clue standpoint, very rarely do you see a guy. The call of hit of no hit by pitch stands. The count will be 1 0. Florida has zero challenges remaining. Uh, you gotta, you gotta explain this one to me. I mean, you can see the ball change direction, it's very clearly. That one's a little bit tougher to see on the other one. I, I thought it was clear the ball changed direction. I, I think context clue, the one we just saw, made it evident as well because the ball changed plane, where it doesn't typically, it would bounce on the dirt right. versus come out flatter if it's glancing off of a shoe. Well, especially if if it's a breaking ball. The breaking ball is always going to bounce higher anyway. I, I mean, it looked like to me the ball clearly changed directions. Smacked up the middle and gloved by Herring. Great reaction. And a missed opportunity for Florida. Instead of a base runner on and Dale Thomas coming up. Well, pitchers are always the best athletes on the field. This is another example of that ball almost behind him. Mm -hmm. Nice snag. I would like to see him just kind of take a little step towards first and throw it over there instead of running it over there. Maybe need to get that his always cracked right. me up. I mean, pitchers can hit dots at 60 feet six inches, but when they catch a ball on the mound, they got to run it to first base. Here's Dale Thomas. Popped it up. You you never ran it over to first no. base. You sh it would take you two steps to yeah. get there. That's, That's very way too much energy. I'm trying <laughs> to conserve. <laughs> you got to throw 130 pitches. I'm just going to toss it over. Mississippi State is trying to finish off AM. 5 1 lead for the Bulldogs in the ninth inning. That's what you're going to see from Griffin Herring. Fastball will tick up to 93 94. He'll use it the majority of the time, but a pretty good slider behind it. Occasional changeup. He hasn't thrown it much this year. It's pretty much heavy fastball slider. Boy, LSU has got a lot of left handers on that bullpen. There was a time LSU didn't even have a left hand on the staff. They have nine on the staff this year. Hmm. Two and two. Full count. By the way, Missouri is taking Kentucky to extra innings. Cats trying to go to 4 0 in the league, leading 6 3 now in the 11th inning. Simmons Field in Columbia, Missouri. Dribbled foul. Pay off to Thomas. Wind is really whipping left to right now, and that ball is fouled off. What's our wind here when it heats up? Man? We're going out to more south. Going out to left yeah, center. it'll blow out more towards left center. Is the eighth pitch? They end up in the parking lot. Three two. Two hopper gets right past Braswell and into left field. This is the second hit of the game for this. One and oh. And here's Nate Yeski out of the LSU dugout. And a lefty and a righty get loose. Coastal Carolina before coming to Florida. 
ninety six starts in his coastal career and he sends this one high to center. Clean. Two down. And another transfer. This is Jalen Guy transferred in from Liberty. Guy is 0 for 2 tonight. Thomas is the runner at first, and this one's fouled off. Up transfers, sideways transfers. Down transfers. Is there is there any one or other that works better? Guys coming up from say the Sun Belt versus coming over from the Pac-12 or even within the SEC. I, I just think if you're coming into the SEC, it's obviously the best conference in all of college baseball. I think there are some adjustments. I don't care what conference you come from. I, I just think the the pitching is better. The velocity is a little bit more. The game is a little bit faster in the SEC than it is in most other conferences. So yeah, to answer your question, it's definitely a difference. Is the 0-2 to guy? What do you mean faster? I think the players are faster. You know, it's kind of like SEC football, which you do a lot of. I mean, the, so you, just the athleticism. The athleticism. I mean, it's it, you know, you talk about the draft picks every year. I mean, what the SEC's won what the last four College World Series, five out of six, and nine out of the last thirteen. I think that kind of just speaks for itself. It's the best conference in all of college baseball, and it's really not even close. Oh, two. I yes. will say though, <clears throat> this year within the league, at least that that I've seen so far, the weekend stuff isn't quite what we're used to seeing across the board. Um, I, I don't think you have the as many high-end weekend draftable guys as we're used to seeing just across the league. The one, two again, the guy, and he fouls another. Is that? Based on SEC history or relative and comparable to other leagues? No, I think it's it's more based on SEC history. So um, you still could be top of the line in the college game, just not a Paul Skeens out there. Not in the league. No, Ch Chase Burns looking Skeenish. looking pretty good so far. I I the Paul the Paul Skeens come along about every thirty years. Yeah, you know, guy fouls off another. Burns was at Tennessee now at Wake Forest. Keep you up to date. Chopped to third. Tommy White in fair territory. What a play. Came wow. here to prove that he could play defense and after on the mound. I loved it. To short. Shelton. One down, new pitcher in the game for the Florida Gators is Fisher James. Oh, it just, I, I don't know, it's no fun at all. But I, to your point, I kept telling myself, I'm the warmest guy on the field. I'm the yeah. warmest guy on the field. I'm the warmest guy on the field. And I wasn't very warm. <laughs> <laughs> and I was lying to myself. <laughs> hey, Not the warmest guy. One for three tonight. One on one. What impacts more, bitter cold or wind? On the mound? Yeah. Okay, so here, here's and another I'm talking extreme thing. wind, obviously. Yeah. I actually didn't mind pitching into extreme wind because the ball moved more. Yeah. Um, and if you were downwind, you got a little, maybe an extra mile per hour or something, bump. you know. But cold weather was the toughest for me because you couldn't, you know, the ball felt like a golf ball. You know, it just, you, you couldn't get a a good grip or a good feel for the ball, you know. Of course, in my time, we all used pine tar. You know, that was part of the stuff that we used. Not because we knew anything about spin rates. We didn't know anything about spin rate, which was why, why guys were using the tacky stuff, you know, five, six, seven years ago, big time. You just wanted to grip it. We didn't want to be able to feel the ball and be able to grip it. 
you know, and we used it during cold weather. We never used it. I never used it during warm. Once I could work up a little bit of a lather and I had a little moisture on my fingers, use the rosin back. I got all the tacky stuff I needed from that. But when it was cold out and you couldn't sweat, you really couldn't feel the ball. And hitters knew that every pitcher was using something, but they didn't care they because you to. yeah, because they knew that would help you control the yeah. ball to where they're not getting balls up and in at high velocities, you know. And so there were some tricks that we used to be able to just feel the ball a little bit more. After Travinsky's second hit of the night, he's replaced by a pinch runner, Josh Pearson. Coming up. Jake Brown will get a chance over at first. KP, were you finished with your win comment? Was there any other extreme? No, I, I think that, you know, most of the time you show up and the wind's blowing out, you're, you're not too excited to pitch. But if, if it was blowing dead out, Pearson launches this one deep right center. Guy has plenty of space with that hard wind. Especially if if you were somebody that spun it a little bit or could take advantage with a two seam, right? I kind of like the, the place that was weird to pitch was Colorado. Because it never felt like you could get anything to spin. And I'm sure it's altitude. And, I mean, that had to have something to do with it, but it wasn't. I mean, yeah. So you could uh, you could feel it spinning out of your hand. You just get, didn't get the same bite. It didn't. Feel, it never felt like you could spin it as well. And that was out of the hand or the result of the pitch. Yes. Well, no, I guess out of the hand it felt sure about the same. And the hitters smiling. All the hitters loved. Why wouldn't they love to be in Colorado? Yeah, I mean, that's why the Rockies have a hard time attracting free agent pitchers. Yeah. I mean, they have to overpay them to get them there because pitchers just don't want to pitch in Colorado. Ethan Fry is two for three. It's a first throw over to first of the game. Seventh inning, one on. And that one gets right through the wickets on Garrison and allows Brown second base. You guys weren't as impressed as I was that we got to the seventh with only one throw. That's that's a pretty good nugget right there. I, I didn't realize that. Did you, did you come up with that one on your own? I got four people in my head. Oh, all right. So no. Only one is real. So no, you didn't. I did. I did. 12,539 the attendance tonight. Someone handed me that note. It is the sixth highest attendance figure in LSU history. I may top it tomorrow. Ben, what's the feeling around town? Are they pretty excited about this team? Yeah, I think they are. I mean, obviously, coming off a national championship, there's a lot of excitement. You know, LSU, like a lot of other programs, have their first pitch banquet every year, and they set an all-time high in attendance this year at the first pitch banquet. So, yeah, a lot of excitement around Baton Rouge. Who is the keynote speaker? I don't know. Right now, it is empty, but it's going to be rocking again Sunday because that LSU women's basketball team came away with a 70-60 to win over Rice. Kim Mulkey was not happy. She said that was not the SEC championship team on the floor tonight. A lot of selfish play. Starts with me to prep them, I guess. That'll be interesting. It'll be a fun practice tomorrow. Yeah, she doesn't hold her tongue a whole lot. She's going to tell you just about what she's thinking. Not just about. <laughs> Kramer made it to the big leagues last year, huh? Yes, he did. I happened to be there, too. It was a surprise. Well, that must have been cool for it you. It was. Keeping the LSU Paul Maneri showed up, and, of course, Bill Mulkey showed up, which was cool. Two and two, the new catcher, by the way, is Alex Malazzo, the veteran. Now, this is kind of Jay Johnson's defensive package here. Brings Alex Malazzo in. Where was that debut? St. Louis. A punch out for Griffin Herring. That is the 14th strikeout for Florida batters tonight. Uh, Curlin's gone down all four times. First three times up was swinging. This time, <laughs> break a ball the inside part of the plate. The Florida needs him to hit. And he took a fastball off that front hand. You can see the pad he's got on it right now. 
slowed him down for a few weeks. But now Kerland on the year four walks, 28 strikeouts at a leadoff spot. Hey, by the way, is there a more impressive hardware set than Jay Johnson has in his office right now? We've got the Golden Spikes, a Gold Glove, the National Player of the Year trophy, the National Championship trophy, and a National Championship ring. All within like 10 feet of each other. Yeah. And, and this is his third year. Some of us were involved in the discussion, not just window shopping, but. What else? Did, what else impressed you? Well, you kept asking so many questions. I had to kind of take in the rest of the room, and that's that's what I saw. <laughs> Two and one. By the way, I'm curious by nature. Is Kyle. four strikeouts? Well, you well you call four strikeouts. Well, you some some burp. That's what I got too. Yeah. So people. Who calls it something else? I don't know. I Whoever it is, don't talk to me. Either. Probably not someone you should still talk five? to. Five. What do you got? Five. Golden. Golden sombrero. No. I thought. Four was the golden sombrero. Four is the Four sombrero. sombrero. Oh, well, five, five is the be. platinum. What's well, six? Six, six is like, you can't believe you're still in the game. Yeah, six, you go home. Six, you go home. The only way I say that, I saw Sam Horn strike out the big league six times in one game. <laughs> really? Yeah. Six times in one game. And it was an extra inning ball game. And the funny thing is, his seventh at bat, he's down 0 2. The bunt? He's fixing the punch out for the seventh time. And he hits a ball out towards right center field and stands at home plate and watches it after punching out six times. It hits off the top of the wall and kicks in. Now he's got to bust it to get to second. <laughs> Blows out a hammy in between oh, no. first and second. Makes it to second, but he's got to come out of the game and go in the I.L. And I asked him after the game, I, I said, Big Sam, because we won the game, so he was in a decent mood. I said, man, I, I've seen four. I've seen five. I said, we don't have a name for six. I, I got to know. He said, he said, Big Ben, we're just going to call it plenty. <laughs> and so it became the horn of plenty. <laughs> Six punch outs in one game. That is a record shared by seven others. Swing and a miss in another strikeout. 1987 with Keith Smart. Keith Smart. That's right. In the Superdome. To the right side, kicked and boxed. It was a long run for Curlin, who was playing more up the middle, but Braswell reaches. By the way, the Florida Gators, tough loss today. They had to fight back. Eventually lost in Colorado on a last second shot. Are well, you mentioning KP Florida, the best fielding team in the SEC? They can really do it. And Curlin had to go a long way for this ball, but still, I think if you'd ask him after the game, he said, I should have made that play right there. And here's Paxton Lynch. Paxton Kling. Paxton Lynch is a quarterback. That's an error on Cade Curlin, his fifth of the season. Kling is 0 for 2. Did you play in the game against Kentucky in which LSU blew a lead of something like 30? No. That you was, did, that you was did play in a game at Rupp where you handed them their biggest home loss. I think it's loss. still the worst home loss in Kentucky basketball history. 76 to 41. Still remember that one. 1-0 one to Kling. Push to the right side. That will advance the runner. The fourth sack of the season for LSU. Yeah, Jay Johnson looking for a little bit of insurance as we get down to the last couple innings of this ball game. Kyle, you played in the big leagues. Did you play basketball? Uh, I was on the team. Mm -hmm. I was on the team at a career high seven on senior night, Tom, my senior year. Give my mom some flowers. Halftime drop seven. Should have been nine. I got fouled. They didn't call it. <laughs> <laughs> Mina launches this one to left on a different day, different air pattern. That one may leave the park, but instead he's still homerless in his freshman season. Two down. I'd like to take this opportunity. Here's Mac Bingham. In for a strike, he's got an RBI single on a chopper to third. What uh, what was the motivation to go to your signature hairstyle? Honestly, I was coming over here to play basketball and baseball, and I knew there wouldn't be a whole lot of time to worry about the hair design, and I wanted something that I could just hop in the shower and roll with. It's all about maintenance. Yeah, and that's where we end up going. And just kind of stuck with it. 
Well, you mean to tell me that, that that thing achieves its look without any product? I mean, there's an occasional product in it uh, uh, right in the front where the where the two cowlicks are. You know, there's a cowlick right on each side right here. So I got to do a little something every now and then to kind of make it act like it wants to do what it's supposed <laughs> to do. A little convincing. Pass Caglione and into right another RBI for Mac Bingham and he's in his second base LSU extends the lead to seven to one. Stretch that six to one. I got ahead of myself. Well, Jay Johnson pushing the right buttons. Sacrifice bunt, get a runner in score position. LSU been pretty good tonight. Runners in score position. Some big base hits. Here's Tommy White. Four game home run streak on the line for White. And White sends it to right field, pushing Evans back. And that'll close out the eighth. LSU 15 and 0. My freshman year from the free throw line. Now, I didn't have a ton. I think I only had like 28 attempts or whatever, so it didn't qualify because I didn't shoot enough of them. But well, that's Del That's one thing I could do is, We're count. is shoot a little bit. We're going to count. I wasn't going to get up above the rim a whole lot, but if they left me open, I, I could shoot it. Kobe Shelton fouls that one off out of play. I Hold didn't on, know you they didn't get it. above the rim. You were in the dunk contest. Yeah, I went to the dunk contest, and I did eliminate Ken Griffey Jr. in the dunk contest, but it was it was my only dunk that if, I had. If that's not the most humble brag of it, oh yeah, oh I just happened to oh eliminate God. Ken Griffey Jr. It in was the dunk weird. contest. I was a one foot jumper. In other words, if I could get going and go off one foot, I, I could I could get up pretty good. But like off two for whatever reason, just wasn't happening. Just wasn't happening. So Griffey didn't have any hops, or just didn't a, have a little bit. But no, he didn't have a, a whole lot of hops. My dunk was just better than his, and then who did you lose to? I lost to, and I can't call his name, but he was a track star that year. And, and the dude left from like the free throw line, like Jordan did, and dunked. And I just wanted to just pack up He's my stuff and go home. By the way, like I got nothing. Right. To, yeah, I got nothing in the bag for you that. Win. Yeah, I was like, okay, can I leave now? What was uh, uh, what was the dunk contest? I, I, Nike used to hold a celebrity like dunk contest years ago really? and Deion Sanders would show up uh, the running back the running back from the Lions Barry Barry Sanders was there yeah and believe it he at five seven or whatever he could jump up and dunk it and so they they would gather some folks together and, and do a dunk contest every now and then Ken Griffey Jr. Barry Bonds Dion Kenny Lofton all in the same dunk contest the 1991 Foot Locker Slam dunk contest yeah but uh, long time you may ago. have beaten Griff, you may have beaten beaten Junior, in the dunk contest. But I think Randy he, he Johnson went, he, he was went there yard one year on, too. He went yard on you three times. Yeah, he did. Like, he went yard three times on everybody. I felt like. And Delino <laughs> DeShields has mm -hmm. the best score. Yeah, he could get up too. Kenny Lofton was in it the next year. Remember, he played for Arizona's Final Four team in 1988. That's a pretty good basketball. Baseball star Ty Evans one for three with a home run. Now if LSU hangs on this, this is big, and the reason it's so big is obviously you win game one, but you only use two pitchers, your starter and mm -hmm. potentially one guy. So it really sets LSU up for the final two games of this series. Two and two to Evans. There's a lot of chatter, KP, around Jack Caglione going on Sunday. It feels like there was some talk maybe there could be a shift and move him around up in the rotation. Whether or not that occurs, does tonight's outing by Cade Fisher uh, impact 
your line of thinking as to whether or not no. they should consider it? No, I actually thought Fisher was better tonight. Um, I mean, I know the line isn't going to look great, but I thought he was a lot closer. I I understand and agree with what Kevin O'Sullivan's doing. Because the one thing, and it's it's not just Sully, but you talk to people that have watched this Florida team this year. Taglione's power, everybody talk. They talk about defensively how how important he is standing over at first base. And we're gonna. I mean, you know he's gonna start one of the games on the weekends. It makes you defensively better. The other two, that's not all bad. Oh, beautiful backhand pickup. Milan throws just a hair late. And it pulled Jones off the bag. That was the difference. You know, there, there was another middle infielder, Ben, that was from New Mexico that played here. The call of safe is confirmed at first base. LSU has one remaining challenge. So one on a one out for Tyler Shelma. Shell it's over to a pop up and a ground out to first. Some rain up the eastern seaboard it meant that a lot of the ACC series went off a little early today. From a national picture, KP, anything jump out to you in terms of the results so far on this Friday night? Um. I think Wake's season so far has jumped out a little bit. I mean, preseason number one in everybody's poll and scuffled a little bit. Laser to left. Shellnut's first hit to on. And Evans headed to third. Shellnut behind him is going to fill in at second. The Gator's not done yet. Um, I, I think Wake lost the first two series in league and have won the first two this weekend. So it'll be their first series win. The preseason number one team, at least in the ACC. I'll tell you the one that jumps out is the last undefeated team in the country. And that's Florida State. Are they off uh, this weekend? They, I don't know. They shouldn't be. It's the first. Yeah, they're at Clemson. At Clemson, got right down. Ninety-one for a strike to Dale Thomas. Up the middle and off the leather. Toss over to first. Both runners are at third. They're going to try and throw behind them. And we'll get a rundown between second and third, and that will end the game. Base running mistake is kind of adding to Florida's woes on a night.